Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. And with that, I'm going to turn it to Dr. Nina Kim, who's done talks for us before. I think all of you remember Nina. Nina, thanks so much for doing this. And Nina's going to focus on more challenging cases of HIV hep B co-infection. Thank you, Brian. Very happy to be here and talk about my favorite topic, hepatitis B. So I hope in the next 20 minutes to go over a few cases from my own patient panel to illustrate what I think are some of the more challenging aspects of hep B management in co-infected patients, and in the end show you some of the limitations with our current armamentarium of therapy. Full disclosure, for obvious reasons, I will be assuming some general knowledge about hepatitis B, so this is not an introductory talk. Uh, so I welcome any questions in the end if you want me to review concepts. So let's start off with the first case. This is a 44-year-old man with a long-standing history of HIV infection, stage 2, with an ADR CD4 of 220, and chronic hepatitis B infection. He was diagnosed with both in 1996 with a risk factor of sex with men and women, and a history of major depression. His HIV history is notable for multiple antiretroviral therapy regimens, including dual nucleoside analog therapy in the 1990s, which we used to do, of stavudine and 3TC. He has extensive HIV resistance with both protease mutations that you can see here and RT mutations, which pretty much knock out options in, in some of the PI class, the NNRTI class, and limit our choices in terms of NRTIs. His chronic hepatitis B history, so he is E antigen positive with a baseline viral level of 110 million, which is not uncommon in E antigen positive patients. His ultrasound at baseline showed an echogenic liver, and in 2004, the ultrasound showed early hepatofugal flow and a mildly enlarged spleen. So you guys may get these reports of these ultrasounds and uh, scratch our heads about some of this, but I, I wanted to go over this just in terms of an illustration. The ultrasound does not always pick up a cirrhotic liver, but one of the things you can see, obviously, is nodularity that's a little bit more specific for cirrhosis. This patient didn't have nodularity, but he had signs of what I would say is early portal hypertension. So normally, the flow going from the portal vein to the liver should be hepatopetal, meaning that it's basically going from the gut to the liver. Sometimes, occasionally, you can actually see hepatofugal flow, which is basically the opposite. It's moving away and reflects some of the circulatory changes we can see with portal hypertension. So hepatofugal flow should make your eyebrows raise up. And he also started to have show signs of enlarged spleen, which we can see with portal hypertension. So, you know, based on this son sonogram, I would think that he basically had what probably amounted to early cirrhosis. So the notable thing about his history was that he was on, in terms of his hepatitis B, lamivudine and defavir for a number of years with persistent HBV viremia in the five log range. He was also, during this time, on various antiretroviral combinations for many years. So I have two questions to you guys related to this context. One is, what about this persistent hep B viremia? Why am I making such a big deal about this? Well. The first point I want to make is that hep B viremia is not a good thing. <laughs> this is something you want to shut down. There is ongoing hepatitis B viremia can have significant consequences. This was two major studies with long-term follow-up of hepatitis B mono-infected patients. This was conducted in Thailand, excuse me, Taiwan, that highlighted the role of hep B viral replication in disease progression. And you can see here that, so these were, um, you know, Taiwanese adults with chronic hep B they followed over 3,600 patients, and they measured their baseline viral level. So this is all reflecting what their viral level was at baseline. And they followed these folks out over 13 years and found that the hepatitis B viral burden had a dose-dependent relationship with the likelihood of developing hepatocellular carcinoma and cirrhosis down the road, independent of their E antigen status or their baseline ALT. And so these findings have been the main impetus for more proactive hep B treatment and hep B suppression. So that's really our goal in an effort to reverse this natural history. We don't have this comparable natural history in co-infected patients as yet, but I, I hope that eventually we will with some of the observational data that we're, we're studying. So my second question relates to whether you think this is unusual this scenario is unusual or unexpected to have persistent HBV viremia on limbivudine and adefavir. And I would answer to you that it is not unusual for two reasons. One, you can see here, based on this chart, the probability of hep B suppression after a year is noticeably less likely in E antigen positive patients 
with adepavir. Adepavir is simply just not potent enough, particularly when you're starting off with a high viral burden. So this is not what we reach for, and this is one of the main reasons why it is not first-line therapy, but unfortunately it was one of the earlier combinations, antivirals to be approved, and that's all we had. But what about lamivudine? Why would one continue to be viremic on this? Well, this is largely because of the fact that you can develop lamivudine resistance quite readily. And you can see here that the probability of virologic failure is markedly high with each year that you are on lamivudine. This is data from mono-infected patients, but the rates are comparable, if not slightly greater, in co-infected patients. Lamb resistance is almost a given when you have a patient with ongoing viremia on lamivudine. And co-infected patients, like my patient, who are extensively treatment experienced and has seen what is effectively lamivudine monotherapy for a number of years, are particularly vulnerable to this phenomenon. So there are a lot of our co-infected patients out there that you can almost assume have lamivudine resistance to their hepatitis B. So the answer is yes, you know, this is not an uncommon scenario. So he eventually got switched to a regimen of Truvada, Kaletra, and Fosamprenovir in 2007. And with that, his hepiviral level eventually suppressed to a nadir in the 20 range, 20 IU per mil. His CD4 count rose into the 480 range. HIV was suppressed. But then his chemistry panel came back uh, around 2013 showing new creatinine elevation to 1.6, a serum phosphate of 2.5, ALT was still normal. Um, UA showed one plus protein, one plus glucose in the context of a normal serum glucose, no cells or casts. So my question for you guys is what would you do next? So this patient is clearly showing signs of tenofovir nephrotoxicity, something that we are not uncommonly encountering in patients of ours who have been on tenofovir for years. And he's showing signs of renal tubular injury with hypophosphatemia, spilling some glucose in his urine. So he really needs to get off his <laughs> tenofovir. And the question obviously becomes, well, what, what's next? What, what do we have in terms of alternative therapies for hepatitis B? So I thought this would be a good opportunity to go over what these alternative therapies are. Before we talk about oral antivirals, let's talk about PEG interferon. So PEG interferon is approved for chronic hepatitis B. This is something that people forget, <laughs> but it has a, an FDA indication for hepatitis B. And historically, the advantages have been that PEG interferon-based therapy for 48 weeks is a finite treatment course. We don't see drug resistance. And one of the things that we've seen in mono-infected patients, certainly, is that you can achieve some important immunologic endpoints and have continued benefit long after you've start, stopped the PEG interferon. So oftentimes we'll see, we'll have a patient with E antigen positive get started on PEG interferon. They might not have optimal HPV viral suppression on therapy, but they will often seroconvert their E antigen antibody and have, continue to have, enjoy that E antigen negative status for years after stopping and eventually get to a point where they're starting to suppress their HEPI viral levels. There are also some data to suggest there might be higher rates of HEPI surface antigen clearance. Of course, you know, this is not true across the board with hepatitis B. There is certainly data to suggest that certain genotypes are a little bit more favorably predisposed to PEG interferon treatment response, specifically genotype A. But it is something to, to consider in, in your armamentarium. The disadvantages are obviously the fact that it's subcutaneous injection. There are frequent adverse effects for those of you who have treated chronic hep C patients. There's also a very real risk of hepatitis flare with hepatitis B. So what you're trying to stimulate with PEG interferon is sort of an immune-mediated response, an immune-mediated clearance of the virus. And in the context of that, you can kill off some hepatocytes, and that can result in pretty significant clinical manifestation of, of a hepatitis flare, which is obviously going to be quite significant for those who have advanced cirrhosis. So I, I tend to be nervous about using PEG interferon in patients with cirrhosis, particularly if they have uh, child B or C. So anyone who's got decompensated cirrhosis is actually absolutely contraindicated to use PEG interferon. The other big caveat about PEG interferon is that we just don't have very good clinical outcome data. So the treatment efficacy appears to be limited and suboptimal in HIV-infected patients with the, with the data that we have that's fairly limited. There isn't a lot of good trial data, very sparse in fact, especially in patients who don't have immune reconstitution, who have low CD4 cell counts. So not something we reach for first line for that reason. So we, we often look towards oral antivirals. So there are six 
oral an antivirals here that in contrast to interferon have the advantage of low toxicity. I have bolded the ones here that also have activity against HIV. And among these choices, so you, you're gonna obviously wanna pick the one that has high potency against hep B and a high genetic barrier for resistance. And you can see here that far and away, the first choice looks like it's tenofovir. The only drawback here is, of course, that we can't use it in our, our particular patients, but it has the highest potency, greatest barrier to resistance, dual activity against both hep B and HIV. And this is one of the reasons why atenofovir really should be part of the regimen if you're starting therapy on your co-infected patient. So a couple of things to illustrate. How, so we come back, let's just go down the road. We, we talked about the fact that lamivudine is a suboptimal choice just because of its low genetic barrier for resistance. How about adepavir? This is a guy who's already suppressed his hepatitis B. Any reason why we can't use adepavir as, a, as an alternative here? Well, I would remind you guys that adepavir is quite, it is the other nucleotide analog. It's quite molecularly similar to nenofavir. In fact, there are only few molecules of difference. And this is the reason why we do not use these in combination when we're talking about hepatitis B. And a patient who has renal toxicity on tenofovir will almost certainly experience the same with adefavir. <laughs> I would also men mention that it's important to remember that adefavir and tenofovir are not that far away from sodafavir, <laughs> which is something that definitely has high rates of renal toxicity. So not something we're gonna reach for here. So this is sort of a graphical illustration of these different drugs. We talked about the fact that lamivudine, and by, by virtue of the fact that it's basically the same drug, emtricitabine, is not a good option for this patient because he's mo most likely to have lamivudine resistance. Telbivudine, for that same reason, I would say is not an optimal choice just because it actually shares the same resistance pathway, and I'll, I'll show you that momentarily. Also tends to have a, a low, moderate barrier for genetic resistance, so not something we're gonna reach for in patients who are co-infected. So we're really left with our first, our, our two choices of entecavir and tenofovir, and in the end we chose entecavir for our patient. I will mention one thing, which is that, as you can see here, these are the different codons and the mutations associated with hep B resistance to these different nucleoside, nucleotide analogs. And you can see that lamivudine and tecavir share also the same resistance pathway. So if you have an L180M and an M204V, which are the two most common mutations associated lim with lamivudine resistance, you're only a few, <laughs> few codon difference away from entecavir resistance. And so you have to be cautious about that in patients that you suspect has have lamivudine resistance. And for that reason, this patient was started on a higher dose of entecavir at one milligram. But this is something, this is a very real phenomenon that you have to be cautious about. So, you know, in the end, we're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel when, when we're talking about options for this patient. For this reason, I, I thought it would be good to just do a side note and talk about tenofovir or alafinamide. So I'm sure David, Spock, and you all have talked about TAF in the context. It's our next generation prodrug for tenofovir. Advantage being that it has very stable plasma levels and doesn't have as much systemic exposure to the drug and that there are high concentrations that happen in the lymphoid cells, five-fold greater with, with the conversion, cellular conversion that occurs. And for that same reason, there are gonna be high constant, higher concentrations in hepatocytes. And so I think, I think TAF is gonna be very interesting to see some of the clinical data. There's already been phase one data that's presented in the liver meeting a few years ago that showed that it had comparable antiviral activity against hepatitis B compared with TDF. But I, I'll be very interested to see how this plays out in co-infected patients, because a number of co-infected patients will almost certainly be switched to combinations that include TAF. So stay tuned for that. So our patient, getting back to him, we stopped the tenofovir, started in tecavir, and he was continued with hep B, uh, had continued hep B suppression. His ultrasound in 2015 showed a normal size spleen this time. His hepatofugal flow reversed back to hepatopetal, and he's now got a mildly echogenic liver. So I thought that was very interesting. And this is something that I see anecdotally again and again in patients who have been well suppressed on their hepatitis B for a number of years is we can start seeing some improvement sonographically if they had some signs of cirrhosis or portal hypertension. And this was certainly borne out in this study. This trial was published in The Lancet a few years ago, and, and this is in hep B mono-infected patients. 87% of nearly 350 hep B infected patients who were treated with tenofovir and had sustained hep B resistance suppression 
showed histologic improvement on liver biopsy, and 51% had regression of their fibrosis, had regression of their cirrhosis, in fact, by year five of treatment. So this is worth noting, and this is a very important clinical outcome. So obviously something we want to keep in mind. Second case, so we have a few moments just to talk about the last case. This is another, this was a 47-year-old patient of mine with stage three infection. He had a Nader CD4 zero and complicated history of CNS OIs that included cryptococcal meningitis and VZV meningitis, seizure disorder from those episodes, and a spastic paraparesis secondary to HIV myelopathy. And he also had chronic hepatitis B, <laughs> no clinical evidence of cirrhosis. And in 2009, he got started on a regimen of Truvada, Abacavir, Darunavir, and Raltegravir. And I think it was a quintuple combination, largely to try to make sure that he had active agents that penetrated the CNS. That was part of the rationale. The, the interesting thing about this patient was he was also persistently viremic in the five to seven long range in the background of HIV suppression. So it was clear that he was taking his drugs, but he was just not suppressing his hepatitis B, even in the context of Truvada being on board, which I thought was interesting. So a couple things in this patient, he had a peak ALT around late 2011, which is what prompted hep B resistance testing, which confirmed the fact that he developed lumividine resistance. Again, not surprisingly, based on data I showed you, patients with ongoing viremia are most likely to develop this in short order. So he ended up having eventually, and Tecavir started in that context with the higher one milligram dose and had suppression, uh, eventual suppression of his hep B DNA and resolution of his ALT. One thing I will note is that also along with this was the fact that he started having immune reconstitution. And, and I thought it was interesting that his CD4 count started rising right along the time where we started seeing ALT elevation occur. And so I actually think this patient was starting to get some immune reconstitution. And so the remaining time that I have, I'm just gonna talk about some data that we've looked at in the Scenix cohort. We looked at about almost 400 patients with chronic hepatitis B who were on tenofovir. We wanted to look at what their virologic responses were on tenofovir-based therapy. And we wanted to look at risk factors for delayed suppression, hep B suppression. And one of the things that stood out was the fact that if you had a low Nader CD4 count, high baseline H hep B viral level, you were less likely to suppress your, your hep B DNA. In fact, we saw this quite nicely. The other, the other risk factor that stood out was lamivudine exposure. So if you had a fairly extensive history of lamivudine monotherapy, it appeared that you were also about 40% less likely to suppress your hep B. And in fact, we saw this play out. And in, in this Kappelmeier curve, you could see that the median time to hep B suppression was 50 months in patients who are lamivudine experienced compared to 17 months in those who are lamivudine naive, which I think is not exactly sure why this would be. The 3TC does not share the same resistance pathways to nofavir. It could promote compensatory mutations, which can, which can result in more fit viral phenotype. But I also wonder if this reflects the fact that lamivudine-naive patients are actually, in fact, on dual therapy compared to these lamivudine-experienced patients. It's, it's tough to tease out, but it was interesting that it was an independent risk factor. A few words, this is my last slide about dual therapy because it comes up. I think the data has shown that it's probably not worth the cost in additional drug exposure in patients who are mono-infected, who are treatment-naive, but I do think that there may be a role for dual therapy in selected patients, pa particularly those who are treatment-experienced like the first few patients, the first patient I showed you, and especially if they've been viremic on prior therapy, if they're cirrhotic, if they're HIV co-infected, especially in the lamivudine experienced, and transplant patients. This is, an, this is another group where you wanna, you know, they have higher stakes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's also unclear whether the dual therapy should be Truvada or tenofovir and tecavir. So th these are lots of, there are lots of questions related to this. I'm just gonna leave my summary slide about take home points and I don't know if we have any time for questions. I don't want to <laughs> dig in too much to this case time. Yeah.